Welcome back to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. Today we have our practical lecture 2.1 and we will connect this nicely with elements we learned actually in the very early practical lecture 0.1 where we talked a little bit about Unix and SSH. Then we went ahead and basically had a, another practical lecture 1.1 where we then learned a little bit about C programming and then we basically now learned in lecture two how we deal with message passing using the MPI standard. And basically this lecture should now connect all of these lectures what you had before um, and provide you with some initial examples of MPI programs. They're very simple in nature. We will learn this. Um, there's an hello world, ping pong. We learn about collectives like broadcast. But essentially, it keeps the essence of the groundbreaking word of MPI, where you basically are able to communicate between different memory, which is an important part of it. So you can really do parallel programming. But before we enter the material of this lecture, as usual, let us review and connect nicely what we had in lecture two. And lecture two was really um, basically a introduction to MPI. Um, I said also in our center in Jülich, for instance, we have MPI maybe for a whole week, right? So what you learn in this course in one particular lecture can possibly not at all cover everything. But we had very essential elements uh, the last time, which are basically reused again and again. And this is MPI point-to-point -point communication. That is basically what you see here. And we said there's another way of using MPI which have been the MPI collectives. So let's look at this a little bit again, because also in this lecture, we will basically use both. And I'll show you in practicals um, how you really use both. Now, the point-to-point -point communication was really in a way um, as we compared it to handball, right? Right now we have the championship in handball. So consider a player that is throwing a ball to another player. Now, Whereas no rocket science, you would say, but you can imagine that when one player decides to throw to the other player, the other player has to be ready to receive. Right? So in other words, if someone sends the ball over, the other player needs to be ready to receive the ball. Otherwise, it maybe goes, you know, being dropped and, and whatever. And this is the same principle that you basically can, in your mind, see with MPI point-to-point -point communication. We see here that from one memory space, from one processor, we want to basically send some data in the memory space to the other processor somehow. And we learned that this is not shared memory here, so we really do need a message. In order to do this message, um, apparently we have to have a process started that is doing the send of data. And then we learned, okay, with InfiniBand networks or with other networks, um, we will have something require the system buffer to be then also with a receive application ready to receive, right? So that basically this process B waits for process A to send data over the wire. And this is a core concept called MPI point-to-point -point communication, which we will basically also refine today. So I will not do it too long here, The um, let's say the review of lecture two, because we will connect this again and again throughout this lecture. Then you have learned that when we look at practical, um, let's say applications, and I brought you last time one of it we also worked with, which was glacier carving, for instance, where you have with the Elma solver here something where um, a parallel run is done on 16 cores and the details here are not so important. The meshes, the Python scripts, the helper scripts, and so on. Take away the message that here different parallel runs of different um, solvers. So one is Elma solver, the other one is Heidem. And you see that basically the calving and fracture is then done on 560 cores, um, while basically the other elements are done um, on a core uh, which is different, like with 16. And then in between are some serial runs that basically also, um, let's say, transfer meshes and so on. It's not so important, transfer data and a recompute data. Now, the important message to take away here is I just I wanted to give you a very practical example that already with, let's say, um, applications, which not at all are actually very large, right? We talk about 16 cores and 200, uh, 560 cores. Um, this would be very elaborate. 
because you also have to identify to whom you want to send if you do point-to-point -point communication. So let's assume you do parallel runs with 16. Okay, I can, in a sort of full loop, program that to do a send and receive. Maybe if I just have one data item I want to distribute to all 16, um, I just do this in a loop, right? And then suddenly all the 16 cores, we have send, receive, send, receive, send, receive, da 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 da, da, da 16 times. Now that's okay, and I might want to do this, but then suddenly I have 560 cores. And again, you know, doing this in an iterative fashion is simply not good. Hence the MPI standard, especially now when you grow in the number of core usage and the number of tasks you really want to run. Think about production applications today with 10,000, 100,000, of course, especially moving to exascale. We need something more smarter. And we learned last time that actually this is true with the collective communication. Here you have something like an MPI broadcast you see here, where one processor can send one data item to all the others in a certain communicator. I come to this back in a moment. We learned MPI Comword, for instance, as a word of all. So you immediately, with this broadcast specifying this communicator, you basically can address all the processes that you have assigned to this particular job. And then we have learned there's a scatter where you basically then also have one array that you maybe want to use in a smart manner across a different course to basically give the data away. Obviously, we need something called gather um, doing the opposite. So when I want to have one processor collecting all the data, and then I have something called reduce with some nice operation um, where you, for instance, you have also the plus, for instance, which you can use to do a very simple operation and addition here of sort, um, which um, it is an addition, basically, then there to the Garda. And we learned there are many, many more MPI um, interface, uh, let's say, implementations, which have, you know, lots of, lots of, lots of uh, procedures, methods, but only, let's say, 20, 30 are really often used. Many others of these hundreds are actually very special, right? We have all reduce, for instance, and all gather. Uh, and ex extensions basically here that every process is doing the same and gathers, for instance. But that's not the point here. We want to have an introduction with parallel computing using MPI. Now, a couple of concepts also, when we thought about the Hello World applications, really think about real code and then connecting this nicely now to this collective operation and the space of processes that we want to address. We know when we basically have this Hello C program, we're using a C compiler and a job script. We have a C executable that is used in the job script with a scheduler that was the right way, and I will demonstrate it today again. The beautiful element is the MPI environment that is established between MPI init and MPI finalize will know some particular information, which is very relevant for us. Firstly, it is the MPI com world. This communicator, as we call it, the MPI communicator is a word of all processes involved in an application of MPI. You see here 0 to 9, so 10 processes. And of course, we can form subgroups. We let them basically with the subgroups and uh, have different communicator names and then do different communications if we want. For instance, one was a sailing on the boat on the water, while maybe the other um, you know, communication and computing takes care of the waves. But this is also related to the MPI environment in another way that wherever I am in this communicator world, here's the example of MPI com world, I can obtain two essential information. Firstly, the size, which means how many processes are at all in this kind of communicator. And then the rank information, if you remember, rank was this unique ID. What role do I play? in the bigger picture of all the processes, what unique rank I have in all of these different communicators. Hence, you see that here a little bit illustrated. The six will know it is a six, and it will know that there are overall 10 processes, zero to nine. And this gives us interesting opportunities. We will look into this again when we, for instance, decide um, who takes the role of the ping and who takes the role of the pong, right? This was one application we established so let's connect this now nicely into the elements of today. It's hence a lecture that is not only connecting lecture two, basically also other practical lectures we had before. Hence, we will extend now our compiling and programming of C programs to full MPI programs. We add 
MPI statements, but will then quickly understand that the hello world uh, basically is an MPI program, which sort of misses the essential element of message passing. Hence, we had the ping and pong application where we really send something over MPI. We send and receive this point-to-point -point communication. This will be one part of it. In between, I will, of course, um, let you know how we do fine-grained job script requests, allocation of compute resources on Elia. So a little bit more practical examples, how you use a scheduler, how you understand the system setup that we have. And then in the second part, we will then move to the MPI collective. So we will have the understanding of these different operations that we have, um, you know, broadcast, gather, those that involve all of those which are specified by a communicator. And then we'll clarify again the difference between MPI point-to-point -point operations versus collective operations. And then I also want to bring you some example, really, um, of course, in this context, but also then Again, we will learn some practical elements, um, you know, when submitting jobs, which is relevant for the MPI applications. One example is, for instance, learning what it means to run a job against the wall. And I will demonstrate this um, a little bit with a sleep program and no op, so to speak. So interesting enough, you will have outcome of this lecture, really, that you understand really the complex aspects of par parallel programming already. Of course, there is more to it. We leave out parallel I.O. that will come in lecture four. Um, we leave out domain decomposition. That is something more we have in lecture three coming up as well. But you have the basics of this complex aspects of parallel programming. So with MPI, you have the, let's say, tool set to do that. We learned that with different abstractions, we can do this on various levels. Again, point to point versus, for instance, collective operations involving very many processes and also in a way that it's scalable. So you remember we learned also one of the things that we have to submit job scripts, which then specify how many cores I really want to involve, so how many tasks I really want to do. And by learning all of this, you really have the foundations of now writing scientific domain-specific applications or what it is often done today, also reusing existing packages that leverage MPI, but you will be able to understand them. And this is really um, something where you then can program and use HPC programming paradigms here. In this particular example, really distributed memory programming is something what you can do after this lecture. So let us come back to this, what I just explained, just that you get the bigger overview again. We have to always differentiate between the point-to-point -point communication where we have an explicit, let's say, um, other process that we want to address and or processor we want to communicate with versus the idea with collective communication specifying the whole, um, let's say, a world of processes that are defined in this communicator. So these, these are essential basic blocks to understand. And of course, I want to basically now um, demonstrate to you a little bit what we learned the last time in the lecture too, but a bit more in practical terms. So hence, we will lock with SSH into Elia. And that's what I have already done here. When you basically see the login here in my mobile X term, again, this host name minus R, you remember, I can also show that we are now in the login node from basically our earlier system. So let's go and think about what we can do as first example. And this is going into the MPI here and maybe start with essentially the hello MPI. We learned Basically, in practical lecture 1.1, one, one, that we had the Hello C program um, that was pretty boring, did not nothing very much than just saying Hello World. And, and that was not really an MPI program. Now, what we extended here is that we have the init of the MPI environment. As you learned in lecture 2, that's always how an MPI program works. And in between, we have a parallel area and environment where the message passing interface gives us quite nice information as we learned with the size and rank, right? So as of the overall amount of processes and that are available in this communicator, and then what unique process ID, which rank I have within this communicator. And we extended the Hello World program essentially um, to the C program just in a little bit, which is the sort of thing that you see here. So we want to now understand firstly that every process 
knows itself. So we want to have an hello world and saying, I am, you know, this particular rank from this particular amount of processes. Hence, we basically want to understand that we can use this rank information to give different elements out and to do different application logic. Here, it's very simple. We just give the rank out, but later we can use this rank for better purposes. And secondly, you want to also think about that essentially you see here an execution that is independent of the number of cores, right? Once again, so we can do this for two processors that we maybe ask for. We can do this for four processors or more accurate for four tasks. We will also learn a little bit the difference between tasks per node, CPUs involved and so on later on. But essentially, this is another important part. You realize that this application, it is a MPI application is independent of the number of basically the, the course we asked for. So let's do this a little bit. We have now the C program. Um, you remember also we said we have to have the module avail again to check what is now essentially the MPI implementation. There are lots of different tools available here on Elia, which is nice. And for us, it's also good to know there's an MPI, OpenMP implementation that we're going to use. Hence, what the best is to compile this now would be to modulate this. And we decided for this. Doesn't have to be this. Other systems maybe have MPI, um, Parastation MPI implementations, for instance, right? So, of course, it depends which ones you want to use. We use this one with the Hello um, MPI C program and want to specify it as Hello MPI. Oops, maybe I did something. Ah, we didn't call it Hello MPI. We just called it Hello C still. That's not a problem. So um, then I just changed this to this. Over the years, I had different approaches to this. Sorry for that. But in a way, that's not a problem. Um, more notably, what's important is that we have now a sub submit script, which is now the counterpart, if you remember. Right, and here is now something what we want to specify. Here you have the name to really differentiate it from our C program. I call now the job hello MPI example. Um, then you have the partition Utoon. You remember that's our teaching partition, so to speak, on Elia that is available to us in the course. The number of nodes and the number of tasks per node. So here four should indicate now how many processes and how many tasks we want to run there. Hence, when we now run this with four, we expect that we get, let's say, the rank um, on size four, and the rank should be from zero to three, right? So in other words, we do this execution four times. We learned this also last time. It was the same program, right? And then multiple data, SPMD. So um, when we do this, at fetch submit hello, we get this interesting job ID. Um, that is, if you remember from the um, theoretic lecture, very important, but also from the practical lecture we had already with C. So that's how we recognize that this job was running. It is a very fast job. That's why it is basically not in the SQ, another command I want to show you today, where basically our jobs are usually in, but we learn this later with longer running jobs that the job is still appearing. Hence for us in the moment is all what we want to know was it running well with the hello MPI? And this was the submit hello program. We have a job ID with a 04 at the end. So when we look into this, um, we expect to have this four in terms of uh, the overall size of processes because we asked in the job script for four. And then the rank information is always starting with zero up to basically the number of processes minus one, which is then zero, one to three. We also learned that when I now, um, let's say, do this a couple of times, so, you know, that's the beauty in HPC, we can do this uh, very easily. Now we have lots of jobs running, but the SQ will be, you know, so quickly already empty because it's so small job that only the outputs remain. And chances are that some of them maybe don't have then this beautiful, um, let's say, way of having an accurate representation of zero, one, two, three. It could be that this is also sometimes out of sync. Now here we don't have an example of this, but just take away the message that these, of course, are all writing in one output. So in a sense, there could be also racist conditions around that. And with this, you already saw this. Um, an interesting approach is now, again, showing you the um, scalability of this, right? So 
submit hello, or maybe more accurately, going back to the hello MPI program. Again, just as a reminder for you, you have learned that we, we program this NIST not with a particular amount of tasks in mind. Right, so nothing prevents me now from saying, well, let's do it with eight. And what I have to do is now I basically don't have to recompile the C program. It's inherent scalable. That will be an important factor, right? It uses MPI, it uses the MPI com world, which then with the environment will be automatically filled of what we specified with a scheduler. So hence, when we now say task per node, maybe eight, we assume that with the same compiled C program, I don't do anything else than just submitting it again, but I have changed the number of processes or number of tasks microbially to be requested. Now, again, the job is very quick. Um, there's no rocket science behind this. You already assume or basically see by the size, right? So these were the size of the file before. Now, when we change it to eight um, instead of four, in fact, the size has doubled, so that gives us already sort of an indicator um, that probably it was working quite well. And we see, um, firstly, that you know with eight ranks or eight size uh, com world, we have this um, you know same C program and it works. And secondly, you see beautifully also know what I meant before. Here is the first processor that is suddenly very much at the end. And here's, a, you know, basically something out of sync in terms of the output written. They all execute at the same time, more or less, but some of them are earlier in writing in the file. And while they write in the file, the file is blocked, so they have to wait. We call that race conditions around the output file. Um, this will be helped with, with something we call parallel I.O. in lecture four, right? Where then also concurrent access to files is usually accepted if you have a parallel file system and so on available. And you can go on and go on. So um, if you just one more, and given the time, we should also maybe carry on. And I think now it's not a big, uh, you know, takeaway message that you can extend it to um, 12 as well, for instance. And then you will see probably that we have uh, more in the output as we also, you know, expect. Good. So you could not do this infinite right so one important takeaway message is also that when you basically have the idea of uh, um, you know now thinking that when we go to the web page here um, we have the different partitions right and each partition has so and so many cores and per node and so on. So if you specify more and more of this number of tasks, chances are that you basically are going above a node. And depending on the really policies on the scheduler, that means that you suddenly use two nodes and not one. But that is something which is very specific to processors. You have to read the documentation like an Elia here. I just showed you um, where you basically then can understand how many um, cores I have really within one node. Right, that's an important part, um, which we don't cover right now, but we come back to this a little bit later. Now, having solved this, um, let's come quickly to the slides, just so you know that I documented the most of it, right? How you create the C program, from there we edited MPI into it. The header is something I forgot, of course. You need to add this to have basically the operations here in C available with MPI init and finalize, you specify the MPI environment, and between those statements, you can really use MPI, right? That is where the MPI com world, for instance, exists. What I have shown you, we have shown how we compile the jobs using the MPI Open MPI 4 um, implementation of this standard. And in a way, we have, you know, we're running this. We have learned that essentially two things it's scalable, so we can do, you know, maybe eight, we can maybe 12. Um, outputs and so on. But we also learned in a way that this is a sort of um, funny usage of message passing because uh, there was no message to be passed, right? So it's a bit weird, but of course it's a hello world example or in this case, a hello MPI example. Hence, the beauty of basically this comes really when you want to exchange data. And you see that a little bit as an example again, 
here how the ranks now work. You have each processor gets now a certain unique rank. And the idea is now sending information from rank one, maybe to rank two or from rank zero to rank one. It doesn't matter. Point to point communication. This means message exchanges, right? Hello World didn't do this yet. Why you need this and why you need many of this is maybe if this is practical example that we had here with clustering, if you remember, you would have an input space where you want in parallel cluster this data. So those which are basically closely together should be in one group. It's a data mining algorithm, a parallel algorithm we implemented here with HDB scan, which are then this number of cores can really make scalable. But of course, to understand now in these regions here beyond is something where you also have to understand where the points are when you basically have a domain decomposition here um, that cuts away these clusters. So it's one practical viewpoint, how you make it work and how you can motivate this you know, message exchanges. We talked about the weather forecast. You wanna know what's basically happening in the tiles next to you in order to understand um, you know, um, and inform your current part of the application program. This is all alluding to something called domain decomposition. So it's not completely obvious to you. We will see how that materialized in lecture three. This was more a practical topic here so that we can start with the assignment tomorrow. Now, summarizing this a little bit, um, as I was saying um, here, message passing needs to be between the ENET and the finalize of the MPI environment. We have this interesting um, point to point communication we're talking about. And this is now what we want to use in the ping pong application. And the ping pong application was something you already know from basically lecture two. So I'll go a bit more quicker into it. But let's say we're summarizing it again here with a couple of lines. And you basically have the whole source code of the ping pong that I was quickly showing at the end of lecture two in a much more deep fashion. So firstly, we say, um, basically, we have a typical MPI program, MPI init, MPI finalize, right? And of course, with this goes, we have a typical C program, so main operation and return zero. Now, we mostly, in most of the applications, just add the size and rank here, right? While some actually call that differently, num task refers to the number of tasks we specified in the job script. So it's, in a way, a very nice analogy to do that. But you don't have to. It's a C program. It's not directly linked to it. But this will be, of course, filled with the information from the scheduler, like also this unique rank, which is then from the MPI environment provided. Now, the difference is, in this sense, um, that we can really use this rank information for something useful. In the Hello World or Hello MPI application, we just give it out and say, well, I'm, I'm basically the second executable, the third executable being run here. Uh, and that's it. So how the rank information can be used in a more smart manner is now explained here when we think about the ping and the pong, right? So then this should be the idea of differentiating now um, rank zero from rank one. And the reason is that, as I said earlier, when we have the point-to-point -point communication, we need to have one rank being the sender, but that doesn't mean that everyone else will automatically hear what the sender want to what send. So in other words, we need some one of these whole ranks to be also listening, right? So in other words, we have send and receive a clear role in point to point communication that we now determine by saying rank zero is a basically this first um, core and he wants to do the ping to the destination one. So the kind of core which is or process which is named rank one. And later, we want to also receive something from this rank one. If you remember, we want to have a ping and a pong. That means in the ping, rank zero will initiate this and rank one will listen. But then rank one should return the pong. Hence, the, he also needs to know the source that basically there's a pong coming back. And equally, of course, you can now imagine when we think about the other rank that is now in the first place, maybe waiting for the destination zero to see, okay, um, I get a ping, but then I want to do a pong back. Hence, you need to specify these ranks hand coded. So it's quite hand coded for this kind of two ranks that you have. Important again is the fact uh, both executing the same source code. Once again, when we ask for two processes, 
both execute the same source code. Hence, you need this rank information here to break into this different if statements at a different part in time, right? And for different processes, which are then the uniquely identified one with rank zero and rank one, taking different application logic roles. So let's extend that a little bit to what I said. Um, we want to have first do a ping. Um, we do this by just basically having a message uh, X over the wire. So we don't literally call it a ping. And we have one MPI char that we just sent from the source, um, basically, uh, sorry, to the destination here, that's the MPI sent to destination one, right? And this is in the space of the MPI com world where we got also this information from. So this rank accuracy should be accurate. We also learned when there's a send, there must be a receive. That means at the same time, there's a second executable run on the HPC machine where one process then gets rank equals one. And this will be the one that is receiving the ping. Hence, it needs a buffer, as we learned from this in message, which should be of the size one in API char. That's what I sent here. So I better be listening in this size. And I want to get it from the source, zero. So I'm ready to receive something from rank zero. And the tag is basically just something that you can here and there use a little bit for some information in MPI status. Uh, it's basically something which you see here. The MPI message exchanges can be filled with some status informations here um, in that we then can use to get some user information out. And now having fulfilled the ping, we want to do the pong, which is then the MPI send out message again to the destination rank zero now, which is this fellow, um, with the same idea, one MPI char will be sent to the destination zero and the face uh, in the space of MPI com world. Hence, we need also the initial ping sender to be ready to receive now the pong, right? That makes the ping pong now really complete, where then the initiator of the send in the first place becomes a receiver, gets an in message back, where the pong comes back uh, with the same way of having the source from rank one. So in a way, not really rocket science, but you can imagine that this is now already a very mini parallel application. And when you grow this bigger and now do MPI communication point to point with many different ones for many different roles, it can be quickly become quite complex. You see also here um, that we can use the status information to understand how much comes really out of this. Um, but before I dive too much into this, um, let us just also go on the practical perspective, because this is a practical lecture, so let's have the slides as a backup. And we want to go to ping pong here, and ping pong means we want to understand a little bit first if we have really the same executable here and the same C program. So that's essentially all what you see on the slides, which I just explained. Um, which we then want to give out what was really getting over the wire with the MPI status information from, from here. So hence, both will do this, and we have the typical way of saying um, that we want to maybe first, we don't really need to load here the MPI again, just so that you don't forget it, and then send me images, does it doesn't work. It's always good to maybe do this um, just in case. Now we know that we have the MPICC compiler available with the ping pong program. We want to do minus O, which is optional, but it gives us a nice way of controlling how the executable is called. So now we have this executable ping pong, and you know it's executable by this X, remember, that I showed you also in earlier lectures already with the C program. In this way, nothing changes really um, with this kind of MPI program now. Again, here, uh, the job script that we want to use is we name the job just ping pong. It should be basically using our U-Tune uh, partition. And we have number of nodes is one and two tasks per nodes. Hence, we want to have two processes doing a ping and pong. And instead of doing the MPI run with hello, I just do it now with ping pong, which is our executable we just specified. As when we dispatch it, um, then hopefully we see a ping and pong. We have our um, job ID here. I put you SQ to show you that again, the job is so quick that it's not in the queue. So we come later to jobs which are a bit longer running, then I can show you that this is actually working. But here, this is so quick that you don't see something, the output is already written. So let's go 
and see this was a job ID. So we have here an output in the same directory from Slurm with this job ID. What do we have there? And what we basically see there is that the ping and pong obviously was working. We see we received one char from task one with tag one. Um, and then in task one, the opposite now, we received one char also from task zero with tag one. Hence, the ping pong was working. And the MPI status could really give us this information, um, basically, that we see here. And this was a ping pong program, so admittedly not the not the biggest um, you know program in application. And of course, again, what I just described to you is in a way really um, you know here, um, basically all on these different slides. I want to make a connection again that when you submit it, of course, before you submit, usually you would also think about an MPA applications. Um, two things. Firstly, the partition. That's what you already know is a teaching partition I saw to you. But then you maybe also want consultant monitoring tool that you see here. For instance, we see Ganglia tool where you maybe have also then our different nodes. You see here there are many compute nodes in this ELIA system and they're quite used by scientists as we see here. There are some quite nice loads. But we also learned that for us in the Uton partition, there's this particular compute one, two, three, and four nodes. So we can see, aha, uh -huh, there's not much load. This hopefully will change when we do more or less our uh, assignment one. However, we will also learn assignment one has really small MPI jobs. So there will also not be, you know, very, very dramatic in terms of loads for these processes. But this is something what you also often do in practice. You will check um, when you have a 512 core node um, job. Is there lots of you know load on the job? If you have thousands of cores to use, you have to understand a little bit the schedule again. Then we did basically all what we um, already learned in the last time here: the number of nodes, the number of tasks per nodes, too, to basically stay within a node. We also learned that we can show some information with this S control show partition in Uton, understanding this compute one to four. It's just what I just explained to you in Ganglia. So these are the ones that I assigned to the Uton partition that you also see in Ganglia and they seem to be free. That's quite nice. We submitted the job with a submit you know, script and in the output then we had this confirmation that we basically hard coded at the end of this ping pong application to understand if something really was going over the wire and not. So in a way, that's really the most I wanted to show. There's just one more thing left. And I think this goes back to many of the questions I again and again get from, you know, basically students. And hence, I said to you, this course is learned, uh, incorporates lessons learned. So let's do the following. When we say we have a submit ping pong program. And again, here it's important to understand that we can do S control, show job ID, and then we have this interesting job ID we just had, for instance, and something similar is on the, on the slide. But you will see that we just used one node. It was not compute one, it was compute two. And basically, um, we see how many CPUs we have here available in this node. And we can also further refine this actually by saying how many CPUs you want per tasks. Because now we have number of tasks two. But there's also a Slurm command that basically gives us the opportunity to increase this. So this is an advanced topic. We don't will talk about it today. For me, it's now more important that you understand the difference between nodes and this tasks that we specify. OK, so we will do other things later in the course. So we have a node list compute two. Now, what will happen if I now would say uh, basically two nodes? Right, And then I would say I have no, not only one task per node. Once again, double checking, it partition u two, two nodes, one node. Um, you will execute this with edge batch. And now we're executing the job. We have a job ID. We assume with SQ it will be very quick, so it's already computed and basically finished. So we can see obviously the output here. And when we go into this, we see it is the same thing, right? I could, of course, send and receive a message across the nodes. That's what we do. That's what we want with MPI, right? So this is the first element to learn. 
And secondly, uh, when we again uh, go into the details here um, of the um, understanding of do we really have used in this last job um, two nodes, we can have this nice S control show job ID command, which then gives us the information that the particular this job was completed. Um, we have the different, basically the specified um, you know, ID, which is different than the one before, okay. And we use two nodes, compute two and three. Now, our number of tasks was still two, but the available number of CPUs is four. So here we can also now increase again, um, basically CPUs per task and so on. And these are the elements that we also can extend later on. But here you see now clearly that we use essentially two of these nodes. And this is an important factor to understand um, as part of this initial part of MPI. So be careful. In other words, when you have a job um, script, and this goes as a warning because I've seen it happening in the course, that people do lots of nodes, right? You want to use MPI maybe with 12, um, you know, giving it 12 times out. Theoretically, that would work, but the partition Yotun would have not 12 nodes available. We have just compute basically one to four. Hence, this is an important factor, and quickly you will, you know, fully load the, um, you know, the kind of partition u with one job only from one student. So hence, this is a loaded element, which you should avoid. Be careful with the node command. Um, you can play around with the number of tasks, as we did before, if you remember, and then that's all right. Good. Having done this basics here now, I think, and some of the things actually also in the earlier documentation here. Um, so what I explained, just that you know, I think that's all really uh, for the first part. And in the second part, now we will understand better MPI collectives and the message exchange options that I really have.